And I also want to recognize Steve Ballard and his service to East Carolina University over these past 12 years. As you all know, uh, Steve will step down at the end of June uh, and Cecil Staten will succeed him. And Steve, are you here? Stand up, please, so we can acknowledge. I guess he's not here. These short timers, I'll tell you what. <laughs> hard to keep them corralled. Uh, since we met last April, I, as I said, I finished the last rounds of my visits to complete the 17 campus tour of the UNC system, and I finished appropriately enough at the most recent addition to the UNC family, that is the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Uh, while I was there, student researchers fitted me with a backpack stuffed with physics textbooks and measured the effect on my walking style, and I look forward to reporting the results of that study <laughs> to you soon. But it's a thrill to see firsthand the kind of remarkable work that is happening every day across the university and this state. And I am profoundly grateful to the students, to the faculty and staff, administrators, uh, and all who offered such hospitality and generosity. I also want to recognize and thank the team at General Administration, and especially Jonathan Kapler, for making the tour such a success. And Jonathan, if you're here, give a little wave. There you are. <laughs> of course, a $9 billion enterprise that we oversee ought to be able to walk and Junius Gonzalez and I hosted our first chancellor's retreat at the end of April, which gave us a chance to hear in detail about the state of each institution, our leaders' biggest opportunities and challenges, and where we collectively want to go as a university. It was energetic, intellectually rich, collegial, candid, and exactly the way you'd expect a group of very talented leaders to work together. Uh, as I've said before, our chancellors must be front and center in our work, and we plan to hold the, an event like this uh, at least twice a year. Not surprisingly, I have spent a good part of the last few weeks in Raleigh meeting with state legislators and staff, learning their perspectives and concerns, and advocating for the, advocating for the needs of the system and its students. As you'll hear later today in the Committee on Budget and Finance, we're about halfway through the legislative budget process. Our top priority continues to be merit-based pay raises for faculty and staff, a step we all know is needed to keep and develop the top talent we need in this university. We're continuing to push for smart investments in data analytics to boost student success and to give us a better measures of accountability as, as we've discussed previously. We're also working to extend the carry forward authority we earned last year, which will allow campus leaders the flexibility to better manage their institutions and address key needs. We often talk about lessons higher education can learn from business, and the carry forward is a good example of how state policy can encourage the right kinds of strategic management and certainty. We are, as we discussed last month, working closely with House and Senate leaders to tackle the issues raised by NC Gap. Everyone at the table agrees we can and should do more to help students make responsible, informed decisions about their educational paths and options. And I'm grateful for the leadership of so many legislators who care deeply about the underlying issues. Senator Berger, Speaker Moore, Senators Apodaca, Barefoot, Robinson, and Representatives Fraley, Horn, and Haynes. We've worked alongside our partners in the community college system throughout this effort, and there's mutual agreement that the UNC needs to craft a plan that focuses on improving student outcomes. I've committed to bring such a plan before the Board of Governors and the legislature before the end of this year that will tackle these high priorities. And we're also engaging in constructive conversations surrounding Senate Bill 873 and working closely with our chancellors to identify ways we might strengthen that proposed legislation. But there is no doubt that we share the underlying goals of making college more affordable, making the cost to students and families more predictable and stable, and encouraging more students to pursue an education at UNC institutions that can and will welcome them. We continue to hear about concerns regarding House Bill 2 and its various effects across the university system. As public discussion continues, we're in the process of engaging legal counsel to represent the university in the two related lawsuits that have been filed against us, and we'll be talking more about that tomorrow. In other matters, I'd also like to take this opportunity to announce the formation of an online learning task force. 
As I've mentioned previously, we need to know more about what we are doing with online learning and how we can maximize the tech platforms to meet our core mission and track progress and measure success. This task force will include faculty and administrators from the university as well as independent experts. Their work will commence in June and wrap up by the end of the calendar year. From my earliest days on the job, you've heard me talk about the need for more policy and strategy discussions during these board meetings, enabling us to use our time together and the presence of the chancellors more effectively to tackle high-level, top-priority concerns. That notion was reflected in the in-depth interviews that BCG conducted with many of you in this room, and those conversations also honed in on the need for a new strategic planning process, which the full board approved last month. Based on conversations with Chairman Bissett, Governor Mitchell, and the Strategic Planning Committee, we are beginning to realign our board meetings to more clearly focus on the major priorities within that strategic planning effort, guided by our five key themes of access, affordability and efficiency, student success, economic impact, and last, excellent and diverse institutions. I hope you'll feel energized by this process and will come away from those meetings pleased by the depth and quality of our deliberations. We're going to move away from the just-in-time planning that has too often characterized these gatherings, working instead to telegraph topics and reading well in advance so we can all arrive prepared and ready to engage. You should have received a master's calendar and a strategic planning overview as part of your packet of information for this meeting, and you'll note that it lays out discussion topics for the months ahead. We want to start handling the routine administrative and transactional business of each committee and appropriately noticed meetings to be held by conference call about one week before the regularly scheduled board meetings. As approved, these items would then be included on the full board's consent agenda unless they need to be handled independently. This work has already begun as p and and Budget and Finance held pre-meetings earlier this week to work through these items. And in keeping with our goal of empowering chancellors and using system leadership more strategically, the p and committee is now discussing two policy revisions that would further streamline the board approval process for salary adjustments. In addition, the board standing committees will collectively take up the work of strategic planning with each committee focused on one of the five key themes. In keeping with the guidance from the strategic planning committee, the committees will assess what is working well within their assigned areas of focus, where we have gaps, and how we can best move forward. Each of you brings a wealth of valuable experience to these deliberations, and we want to make sure our chancellors are playing a key leadership role as well. We'll also bring in experts from around the country to share data, best practices, and other insights to inform our discussions. Which brings us to our policy discussion this morning. Today, we are joined by Jay Puckett from BCG, whom you know, and whom we, we have asked to set the stage for this strategic planning process. And I want to thank Jay for going above and beyond the call of duty and uh, the initial scope of work that they did for us. Next, we'll hear from Andrew Kelly, resident scholar and director of the Center on Higher Education Reform at the American Enterprise Institute, who will present on emerging national trends in higher education. I've known Andrew for over 10 years, and he is one of the most well-respected higher education policy experts in the country. He's worked on behalf of business organizations, national philanthropists, and in conjunction with other state systems of higher education. He's a Phi, Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Dartmouth College, where he earned a degree in history in 2002. He holds a master's degree and a PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley, where he was a National Science Foundation Research Training Fellow and was honored as an outstanding graduate student instructor. I am thrilled to announce that as of August 15th, he will serve as Senior Vice President of Strategy and Policy here at UNC. The university is lucky to get him and I know you'll enjoy working with him. Following Andrew's presentation, we will hear from our own Dr. Jim Johnson of the Keenan Flagler Business School at UNC Chapel Hill, who will share data and insight on the future of North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. <laughs>